Ars Electronica archive itself has recently undergone a transformation or um, let's say an update. Uh, what you might or might not be aware of is that Ars Electronica has a quite big both physical and digital um, company archive that was an originally founded to document the submission materials to the Prias Electronica, um, which has been implemented since 1987, it's as old as I am. Um, so there is quite a large extent of archival material on the submissions of artworks to the Prias Electronica, which were still done in physical ways until I would guess early 2000s, at least partly, that the possibility actually still exists. So if you do submit to Prias Electronica, you can send in physical materials to submit your artwork, but we do not promise to give it back. So, um, with the support of the Federal Ministry of Arts, Culture, Civil Service and Sports, we have recently um, done a little bit of an update to our archive, which involved, on the one hand, uh, a restructuring of the digital infrastructure, of the um, data model and of the server structure. Um, but what we also did is we created a lot of new material as part of this project. Um, one especially nice part of that was the digitization of the estate of Hannes Leopold Seder, one of the founders of Ars Electronica. And so we, had, uh, we inherited the materials of his work uh, over the period, a uh, very long period that he uh, worked on creating what Ars Electronica is today. And we digitized um, selected parts of that, a lot of correspondence and really interesting material. The other part of the project was to integrate new born digital data into the archive, uh, namely, <clears throat> namely um, many of the pre-submissions. So as you uh, might imagine, nowadays, pretty much 100% of the submissions to Prias Electronica are submitted through our online platform digitally. And so as part of this project, we also uh, took a lot of those digital born materials and moved them into the archive so that they would also be um, accessible through the archive for the world to see um, so that anybody who is interested can learn all the shapes and forms that media arts can take. All right, uh, both of the material corpora that we created uh, were also provided to Europeana through Kulturpool, which is the Austrian aggregator for passing on uh, digital heritage data to Europeana. So this was the whole endeavor that gives the framework for this panel today. All right, enough about us. Let's talk about all of you. Um, I would very much like to uh, give you all also the opportunity to introduce yourselves. And I would like to hear also from your perspective one example uh, of a digital archive or digital archival project, if we can name it that. We will discuss that then in the next step uh, that you have recently been working on. And Sandra, I would invite you uh, to start. Yeah. I am Managing Director of the Kaiserschild Foundation. We are a foundation that has several statutory purposes and one is fine art. We do have an art collection in the foundation, mainly comprising of Dutch old masters from the 17th century. And um, our mission in fine art is to preserve cultural and artistic values as well as to make art accessible to the public. Um, with the main focus on our art collection, that is because we are not a founding or a funding foundation, but um, we have to develop and implement our projects ourselves and in fine art, um, we use our collection as a starting point. This collection is on display partly, as mentioned before, in um, Alte Galerie in Schloss Eggenberg in Graz, currently in the exhibition between dying and dancing, tales of the early modern period, but we have been looking for new ways to add to this exhibition experience also in order to reach new audiences if possible. We took a first step into this direction two years ago when we uh, implemented a street art project in which street artists interpret um, some of the 
some of the paintings from our collection. We try to connect it very closely to the original paintings and um, show also on the walls out there the original paintings and um, the street artists also accompanied by a curator through the path of the interpretation. But um, to the digitalization part of it, um, we took a very new approach um, just currently and we were able to present our very new project Kaiserschild Art Defined within the last two days here at Ars Electronica. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do so. Within Kaiserschild Art Defined, we digitize paintings in high resolution. This is very much work in progress at the moment. We are in the middle of our first production. Um, we dedicate this first production to one of the most important artists from our collection, Peter Klaas, um, still life painter from the 17th century. We digitized this painting from our collection and added to others um, from other collections who show different perspectives of the work of Peter Glass, one from Kunstmuseum Winterthur, the other one from Kunsthistorisches Museum Wien, all three in high resolution. And we use these high resolution images in different ways in art education. One great possibility is to show them in the Ars Electronica deep space. We did so the last two days together with an expert from um, the Alte Galerie, Stefan Albel, who is responsible for our collection and is curator for the early modern period. We have a cinematic approach. We produce films using these high resolution images on diff different aspects on the, of the work of Peter Klaas, we also have been showing the first three of these films at Ars Electronica. And um, one of our main goals within this project is to bring together the original paintings with the high resolution images in the museums who are partnering. So we are currently planning on a traveling exhibitions with the three paintings we digitized together with the high resolution paintings and the films in an installation. And we will start in Kunsthistorisches Museum by 2025 and move on to Kunstmuseum Winterthur and Alte Galerie in 2026. So we have very different venues, different audiences, and for us it's, it's a trial. So we are going to test and um, evaluate this project. Thank you very much. A wonderful example, of course, also for us as a not only festival venue, but us also as a museum to um, get new contents in that we would otherwise not have access to. So also for us, a very fruitful collaboration and we're very happy to be working together uh, with the Kaiserschild Foundation also. Chiara, you also uh, work with museums together and uh, especially also with 3D scanning. Um, but what you also have, and this is also uh, very close to my heart, uh, you also have the GAMS, because uh, Chiara is located at the University of Graz in Styria, and uh, the GAMS, that's like a, an Austrian animal that lives in the Alps, but it also is a, a fantastic data archive for the humanities. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, probably I must say that I came to the world of media art, digital preservation, through uh, a very different way. I'm originally, I studied classics and archaeology, and so this is kind of the objects I tended to work with, uh, and that got me interested in digital data. I then uh, studied museology and worked a bit in museums, and I got interested in the way museums use their data. And while I was looking for my next adventure, as you say, I landed in Graz. I was very lucky to end up in this Department of Digital Humanities, uh, where we have uh, this digital asset management system, which is also a certified repository. GAMS, I think, is chamois, probably, in English. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is an example of a recent project where I could combine my background in archaeology with my passion for 3D, for uh, mediation in museums, uh, and the use of our platform and repository. Uh, I think uh, the challenge that is interesting for us in that context is uh, how to uh, present the data of the museums and to work with semantic web technologies and museum data. And here I just have a snapshot, very little one of the code behind uh, the <laughs> nice interface, nicer interface that we try to create. Uh, and uh, how we can actually not only create this data, but then in my research, a lot of it is also about grabbing data from other museums uh, and try to work with them a bit more. 
And this project was very interesting because, as you see, it's uh, based on 3D technologies. We had uh, a scanner of the building and we had photogrammetry models of some of the, uh, these copies of ancient Greek and Roman statues in the Museum of the University of Graz. And they are very difficult uh, to uh, work with in terms of preservation. So this was our first project in which we tried to prepare a content model for the repository, which could host 3D models, which means thinking about which formats, uh, because just between uh, this uh, room uh, and the single statue that we see there, uh, well, I had a thing to, to constantly uh, export and import my models through very different formats, uh, figure out which one is uh, better geared towards uh, long-term archiving and digital preservation, and think about the metadata I wanted to save for that. Uh, and this is something that for me is very interesting because 3D, thanks to photogrammetry, mainly has become very accessible, uh, but also in the context of the Europeana that you mentioned is being very pro much promoted. Uh, but it's very difficult to actually preserve all these activities for the long term. So thinking about uh, how to ingest my models into our local archive, into GAMS as this certified repository was a first hurdle, and uh, how to think next, how to further evolve this type of projects will be probably my future challenge. Uh, and I think uh, the last part probably that's for me very interesting is also how I'm gonna use these models in the future. I talked about the data and the possibility of mining them and playing with them. Uh, when it comes to 3D, I can also think about all the application uh, in VR, AR, and so on, uh, or uh, how to create interfaces to explore the data in a nicer way. And that's uh, probably a yeah, part of the discussion we will have later. <laughs> Thank you very much. A lot of what you mentioned, of course, also refers to the sustainability of data, also the, the long-term sustainability of data. So what is it actually used and reused for? But in order for that to happen, the data first has to be found and accessed. And a fantastic project to make uh, data about media arts, archival data, and in what way they are archival data, you will tell us in a minute, uh, more accessible is a really inspired project that Alessandro has recently been implementing in collaboration with V2. I mentioned that Alessandro works for Neural, um, the, doesn't work for Neural, is Neural actually. <laughs> Um, and Neural, of course, has a huge archive, just as V2, with the very long-standing history of the organization as well. And you both really come from the core of the media art scene, so linking those collections together, of course, has huge potential also to make research more, uh, more possible on these kind of data sources. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um... The whole, I mean, uh, there are two steps on these projects, which is worth to mention, and then there are a few credits, but before that, uh, thank you for embodying Neural with my, <laughs> my, myself, but actually I found it together with another person, Ivan Yusko, and uh, there are quite a few people, of course, uh, uh, working for it. Um, anyway, the two main steps of these projects are <coughs> The, in the beginning of what we call the Neural Archive Initiatives, which started at the beginning of 2010s uh, and started uh, uh, trying to find out a way to reciprocate the generosity of the media art worldwide community that uh, in uh, back then, 20 years, uh, gifted us uh, thousands uh, of physical publications. Uh, and uh, I usually mention the fact that uh, traveling a lot, uh, especially for media art uh, opportunities, I usually have this hobby of checking the local library or the institutional library about media art and systematically being quite disappointed <laughs> by what I can find there. Not really for librarians' fault, but for how the whole concept, it's still something that it's not completely acknowledged, so you can find an AutoCAD manual in the media art uh, section and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, that's just to say that we realized we have a remarkable collection that was at, at the 95% donated to us. Um, it, it was clearly impossible to make it uh, publicly available, 
Uh, and so we decided to do something online. And that was the first step, because what we did was just to make uh, uh, an extensive catalog of everything that we got, uh, including, and I'm talking about classic publications, that's the part of archive that we decided to put online. Uh, and so out of the current 7,000 uh, different titles, uh, all, we managed to put almost 2,000 there. But it's like a library catalog, so that's the, um, the bibliographical data, the scan of the cover, and uh, a little bit more data. There's the content index. I can come up with to that later when we talk, we talk about copyright. Um, the idea was not to just uh, publicly assume the responsibility of this collection to say, okay, we have all these different objects and we take responsibility of preserving it, but also to test a way uh, to offer the same way of taking responsibility to other institutions. So we, we commissioned actually an online, the, the online database, all made with free software. Uh, we commissioned the uh, interface. Uh, everything is public and on GitHub to be downloaded. But again, the idea was to offer this also to other possible institutions. The main idea behind it is that for media art especially, there is uh, not a central place that can be considered the main archive, but there, are, there is a kind of an archipelago of uh, islands of cultures, of islands of media art culture that has preserved chunks of this history. So the idea was again to connect them, give, uh, making the first step. And I found out that there is even a definition for that which is a polycentric which is exactly what we were trying to do. So we are trying to do a polycentric system, and that's what I personally call distributed archive. Uh, the second step, was, which was crucial to make it happen, uh, took 10 years actually to happen, and was the wonderful uh, um, um, Alex Adriansen residency that I very, um, I mean, was very honored to get from V2. And during the residency, there was the possibility to discuss, uh, finally, uh, to join forces uh, in order to make it happen. And since we have very uh, relatable uh, digital archives, beyond the archive that I'm mentioning, we have websites with almost 7,000 entries, each of us, uh, going back to the end of 90s, uh, in case of V2, well, before that, V2 is one of the oldest, for sure, um, institutions, uh, we teamed up uh, with the uh, task to make the two of them being searched together. Let me just make um, a, a, a very quick note. This is something that has been attempted many times in the media art scene since the early 2000s. I remember also as Electronica being involved in some of these efforts. Unfortunately, never really succeeding because each institution trusted the whatever standard of database and such. And when you have different standards, it's almost impossible to join them. In this case, we had, uh, it was not only us, we needed uh, a technical brilliant mind, uh, which is over there, Walter, who really uh, joined us uh, with the same uh, uh, passionate spirit to do it. And with the, the, the difference was that um, uh, in the past, it has always been attempted as a top-down approach. We tried the, the opposite, so bottom-up, raising the data and integrating them. And I can happily say that it worked. Uh, since um, actually, I think a couple, less than a month for sure, it's possible on both websites to search, to make a search, and the search can be extended to the other website. But when you click on the links, you end up in the respective website that hosts the content. Of course, this was meant um, as a research project during the residency as a prototype to host possibly even more um, institutional archive like that. And uh, let me just add one thing which I'm particularly keen on, which is that it's literally joined the fort between the two, in our case not for profit, and it's more or less the same for V2 institutions that join forces 
to merge their digitalized resources. And uh, it's uh, um, stopping the need to use any further commercial platform to make it work somehow, which is, I think, one of the core values that you try to implement. Yeah, thank you very much. I still want to point out the screenshot. This is a screenshot of the V2 website. And here you can see that you get here the results uh, of, the, of the V2 website itself. And here on the side, you have the results from Neural. And then on the Neural website, it works the other way around. This is also why I so absolutely wanted to have Alessandro here on the panel, because exactly as you said, to connect different archives, it is not only in the media arts a challenge, but in the media arts, it seems to be a particularly peculiar challenge because everybody's working with digital stuff, right? So one would expect that would be easier to do. And to finally have a prototype of how such a connection could be made, I just find such a fantastic outcome that you achieved. So that's uh, why I was also so happy that you decided to join us. Katarina, you have also been joining uh, two archives, but in a very different uh, manner or sense in one of your recent projects. You have combined uh, two Peter Handke collections at two different very uh, uh, established institutions at the German Literature Archive in Marbach and at the Austrian National Library. Um, so Peter Handke physical materials in physical literature archives dispersed in different places have been brought together in a digital environment. Tell us about that. Okay, so let me explain a bit. Um, so I'm a literary scholar and um, I've been working in physical, in physical and uh, public and uh, private archives uh, and with uh, all kinds of materials in, in those archives uh, for more than 20 years now. Um, and those uh, materials are really interesting because uh, uh, they allow a deeper interpretation of literary works because they uh, um, uh, document the, the creation process of literature, such as, for example, notebooks or drafts or sketches or manuscripts, typoscripts of different or, uh, various uh, text versions um, or printing proofs, etc. And so my research interest uh, uh, focuses on the, the literature, the mat materials of uh, Peter Handke. And I don't know if everyone knows Peter Handke. He's an Austrian writer who uh, was awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2019, um, um, Nobel Prize of Literature. And so my uh, experiences, um, or with my experiences gained from working with these materials, I planned or uh, uh, conceived a, a project, um, the project of a digital edition of the notebooks um, of Peter Handke, which are really great uh, materials. Here you can see on this slide one of those uh, uh, a few of the, or the synoptic view of the uh, digital edition. Um, uh, perhaps to to uh, to make the the, the most important um, or my the objectives um, clear. What what would, would do we want to to do with this um, digital edition? We want to. Uh, um, uh, Save or, or um, um, protect uh, the fragile original materials. Uh, we want to uh, bring together the Vanessa mentioned it um, the the collections the, of the notebook collections of uh, German, Austrian, and Switzerland uh, archives, and uh, we want to to uh, draw attention to these uh, uh, exciting objects, which. Um, um, tend to disappear somewhere in the archive boxes. And uh, um, 
we want to to uh, save and share our knowledge with these uh, materials um, in in um, different kinds of of comments and um, yes uh, and we want to um, offer uh, helping tools to to manage the large amount of uh, of pages we we want to edit 11000 pages the whole uh, all of uh, peter hanske's notebooks uh, count uh, on 30000 pages densely written pages you see that um, and yes uh, and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, of fun also to, to do this and we have, for sure we, we, uh, we will talk about the materials a bit later. Yes, and Vanessa has, uh, with her deep digital knowledge, has done essential work in this project. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I don't know if that's maybe a little bit too much of an honor. <laughs> um, maybe we want to stick a little bit with this, with this question of the physical materials. So um, in your project, Katharina, it's of course very um, apparent what, what kind of uh, physical objects you deal with. And also for Sandra, I would say that is true. It's, it's immediately apparent. Um, so maybe you would like the two of you uh, to start to talk a little bit about how these physical materials also transform into data sets in the context of your project. So what does, it, what does that entail and um, what's the process? What is the, maybe let's talk, I'm, I'm Austrian, so I always want to hear about the problems. We can talk about the challenges, but of course we also want to hear about the innovative solutions that you developed. Okay, so then I start. Perhaps uh, I want to 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 say, uh, to say something. What I forgot to say. Um, the the most important thing is for sure we make uh, those uh, notebooks available, which are really not easily accessible, and we make this uh, in form of uh, um, we, we show the the facsimiles um, or high resolution facsimiles. Um, we do this uh, in, uh, with a diplomatic transcription, which is uh, citable, like you can use it for, as a researcher. And uh, we do this in uh, easy readable uh, version. So, and you, you see the, the TI XML document, yeah, so you can um, um, uh, see what we have uh, done to make this uh, visualizations uh, possible. So, um, how do we get to this? Uh, first, you have to digitalize the notebooks, which is uh, a challenge uh, also because this uh, materials are quite fragile. Um, and uh, it sometimes takes a bit of time to, to get uh, the, the um, um, uh, the the uh, a good uh, um, facsimile. Yeah? So, <laughs> um, and the second step is um, to, you have to 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 get a connection between uh, the facsimile and the transcription. So we use uh, a software called Transcribus, um, where we with this software we can um, uh, uh, trans the text and Transcribus um, defines, um, like you can define lines and text regions with coordinates and, uh, and link it or connect it with the, 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 da the data in the um, transcription document. Yeah. So that's the, the second step. And the, and the first step is you have to to um, uh, tag uh, the text, you have uh, you need an encoding. Uh, you have to, to put all the informations about uh, the text, about the visualization, and so on, into the text in form from co in form of codes. Uh, and we are used we are using um, uh, 
uh, a kind of uh, special grammar uh, for for um, encoding. Um, it's called uh, TI. Uh, that's a short form for um, text encoding initiative. Um, it's uh, it, it's a, a grammar for XML. Um, Co encoding um, for uh, editions and that's the most uh, difficult uh, part of our uh, work because um, the, the, the notebooks are really um, special uh, materials because they uh, um, you have to define every um, text phenom phenomenon um, but uh, to make the, the text machine readable, the, uh, to, to allow a programmi, pro programmi, programming <laughs> the, the visualization. And, um, uh, but the, the text, I uh, have a lot of exhibition, uh, exhibitions, no, um, uh, exceptions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. I mean, a very complicated process to come from, uh, from text to text, basically. Um, and I imagine that for the type of material that you work with, the process will be quite different, right? <laughs> because yeah, you're is. working on, well, this is also image, but you're working on a very different type of image. So how does that go? Right, um, we are transferring paintings mainly. And um, I'm not familiar with all the technical details, um, but how you do high resolution images, you take pictures of one image, of one picture, row by row, row by row, and put all together in a big file. That's how you get a big picture, high resolution image where you can zoom in then. And um, the challenges with this pro uh, process mainly are the condition of the paintings mm -hmm. as well as um, the fact that we are not only digitizing in large museums with photo studios, but also in small, less equipped museums where we have to find different solutions and have to improvise a bit. A good example is the first painting we digitized, you've seen there before painting from our collection and it has, it's painted on a wooden panel and it has a big crack in the middle. Not an issue as long as it's in a frame, but it is in a quite a huge frame with some three-dimensional wooden work on it. So when you digitize it, when you do this photographing, there would be shadows from this frame on the painting. That would have been a problem. So we have to take it out and um, put it on an easel. But for this type of photographing, you can't put it on an easel in, a, in the usual way with, with a tilt. You have to put it upright. And we had to find a solution to put it upright without putting pressure on this crack, without creating new issues like shadows again or um, some fuss from some soft material we used to fix it. And I'm very grateful to um, all the curators, to the restorers, and especially to our photographer who put a lot of effort into solving this problem. We found a solution, we did it. I was very relieved when the painting was on the wall again <laughs> with its crack, but in total. And, um, but we used the solution we found again in Kunstmuseum Winterthur because you don't have such an issue with things like that in the Kunstmistorische Museum where there's a photo studio and you have equipment to use in, um, when, you, when you have such a problem. But there again, small museum, no equipment, no photo studio, but we used um, the solution we found for Alte Galerie in Graz for Kunstmuseum Winterthur and it worked. We had different issues there because um, also wooden panel, also structural issues, but we found a solution and so we learn and learn and learn. Yeah, thank you very much. This is <laughs> Of course, there is. you are in principle working with 2D, seemingly 2D objects, while they are actually three-dimensional physical objects, just as, as you are. Um, however, in the digital space, they're of course then represented predominantly flat. That is different in your work, Chiara. You work a lot with 3D scanning as well, right? So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the process there. So how do we get from the physical to the digital object and what are, what are its specificities? And of course, problems. We want to hear the problems. 
Well, that's a good question, and uh, because I have more problems than answers <laughs> on this matter. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, with 3D scanning, there are uh, different scanners, commercial, that we can uh, rent or buy if we're lucky, if we're lucky, the uni as one, uh, and uh, they produce uh, a point cloud in most cases, uh, on which then uh, we work to create the 3D model. Uh, besides 3D scanning, I work a lot also with photogrammetry because it's cheaper and easier, because I can just use my mobile phone to take a lot of photos of an object, uh, put them in a software, and uh, I would say magically the 3D model appears. Uh, in practice, what happens is that the software tries to uh, find the matching points between the photos to create a, a point cloud. Uh, and then out of that, uh, we create a, a sort of a triangular, a triangulization of these points, um, create a mesh, uh, so the surface, uh, and kind of wrap uh, the colors, uh, the, the aspects of the photo around my object so that it becomes a 3D model nice to look at. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then another type of 3D models I work with uh, is also architectural software, in which I basically start from scratch uh, with something like AutoCAD is probably the most famous software that uh, if anyone has a friend who does architecture, will have uh, heard these friends uh, lamenting AutoCAD. Uh, but basically it allows us to sketch, sketch plans and then from there extrude in 3D and work with farther software from this kind of a field uh, to create models of building, for example. Uh, the main problem with all of that uh, is that this software have a, has a learning curve, but it's doable. Photogrammetry, usually the second attempt gives already a nice model. Scanner does it automatically, so we have a very nice point cloud. Uh, but then we have to decide what we want to do with this data. And that's where the problems arrive, because uh, they will all come uh, very likely in very different format. Uh, there are softwares uh, have proprietary formats. Uh, there are very few formats uh, to which we can export. For example, Point Cloud uh, E57 is a common way of exchanging them. Uh, but then maybe they cannot be imported in the software you want to use uh, to create the rendering. Uh, so the main problem is uh, after these first digitalizations to work with the data and actually make them usable mm. uh, because it's a lot of uh, yeah, conversion, finding the right software uh, to convert, export, import, uh, switching from a software for having a point cloud or a plan of a building to build the 3D model or the mesh, um, to apply the lights, apply any animations. Uh, and uh, I think that's the biggest challenge in creating afterwards something that's really usable and uh, with, with which we can interact a lot uh, and which we can then use to create engagement activities of various type. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also by working so much with 3Ds when, when I ended up working a lot, thinking a lot about more digital data and going back to how do we preserve uh, also this data as a uh, self-standing object almost. I consider my 3D model as an object that need to be preserved as much mm. probably as a physical mm. notebook or as a statue. Mm. But that opens another problem, which I think we <laughs> can go in later, perhaps. You mentioned usability, and I would also um, like to sort of, as a, as a service to our audience, um, I would like to talk a little bit about that next. So how do you think, and maybe Alessandro, you can start, um, how do you think that the digital archives that you created are actually, um, how can the people in this room use them? What, what uses do you already see? What uses do you maybe not see, but would you like to see? What usage would you like to avoid, but can't? <laughs> Problems? The, the last I don't know, let me think for a moment. Um, no, uh, <laughs> maybe here we, here we can po focus on the positive. Also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, the, the search possibilities, I think, are key for the kind of archive that we are sharing, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, having a single search that would reach all, I mean, different sources and having a proper search, which means that I can search uh, a, for a certain name and keywords and uh, ears, for example, uh, becomes crucial. So the more potentially detailed is the search, the better can be the result, especially the larger 
the whole uh, uh, searchable data becomes. And there is also another uh, aspect, in our case, uh, uh, being all publications, but we absolutely don't put the PDF there. Uh, we are publishers ourselves, so we know the value of the published work, when it's, which is sustaining publishing efforts. Um, so unless the, the, the publisher allows us to put a PDF online, we don't do that. But one of the uses that I couldn't find when I started is, for example, a PhD student uh, mm -hmm. uh, coming and saying, look, I'm desperately looking for a copy of that, and apparently you have it. Mm -hmm. I would need the scan of this uh, 10 pages, because they are crucial for my thesis. And I mean, we can't offer it as a standard uh, service, but of course, as soon as we have a little bit of time, we deliver it. Mm. Uh, even more, I'm, during this practice, there is also another uh, parallel practice that I have, which is called temporary libraries. I think that uh, the connection between the physical and the digital is absolutely crucial. Mm. I think it's kind of red, thin red line that connects all of us somehow. So knowing that there is a, a physical object somewhere and being able to locate it in space, uh, having an address, a physical address <laughs> for that, uh, so to be even more specific, and then granting some or full access or even a, a kind of augmented access in the case of sophisticated digitalization are two different beasts somehow. Mm. And uh, the, the connection between them, it, it's what can really open different possibilities. So uh, the example for one of the users that is possible, more users, uh, I think that it's all really all about how, how you can and in what ways you use the data that you already have. Mm -hmm. And of course, this also means that, let's say, generally speaking, the better the data, the better you have collected the data in the beginning, more, the, the, the more users you can express afterwards. Uh, um, users that we would not want uh, I mean, we are not for for profit institution, so granting as much as we can uh, is I, I can't think about something. Well, yeah, uh, a commercial use uh, from our uh, own thing, but uh, we, we share the same license, uh, I think, with V2, which uh, uh, stops that, uh, basically. So, Kara, you mentioned also, uh, you already uh, like tapped a little bit, you said educational activities. So I would imagine that the work that you do also is of course a big basis for research activities. What kind of uses do you, so what kind of uses do you design for and what kind of uses surprise you? I think uh, at first, uh, uh, as Alessandro said, reaching people, which means also reaching researchers like the PhD students, uh, uh, or colleagues in other university that, for example, are conducting a study on a certain typology of art, a certain object, a certain replica of a Greek statue, and want to see how this uh, circulated around Europe, for example, they could uh, look at my data and create uh, timelines, comparisons uh, of uh, the presence of these replicas of Greek statues around Europe in collection in the late 19th century, or this type of art historical research and museological research, I think is what I tend to have most in mind because it's also what I like to do myself mm. probably. <laughs> uh, but then there is also uh, educations for various type of students uh, from university students who are doing their first course uh, in art uh, and uh, online resources are fantastic for that. Uh, to general continuing education, as we can say, or just enjoyment of art for people who cannot physically go into the museum or institutions and can look at things online. And I think that's also the thread that you mentioned between physical and uh, digital objects that can give a different type of experience to different visitors, uh, whether online or in person. So I think uh, another strand of research, which I want to quickly mention probably because it's the one probably that I wouldn't say I would like to avoid, but I would like to improve the situation, is uh, that in many cases, collections have been catalogued uh, 
century ago or more. Mm. And these data from the card catalogs that were there are being constantly being kind of replicated mm -hmm. uh, while we switch systems. So sometimes even in a contemporary databases, we have data that have been written in the 1920s uh, or um, earlier on, which are biased. It. They kind of don't agree with the way we see the world today and uh, with the principle we want to hold. So I think for me, a part of the research is also looking at how this data trickle down and how we can remove biases from the way we present collection online uh, while keeping on digitizing and preserving all the information. And that's a huge lot of work, uh, mm. which uh, just to use passwords could be provenance research, post-colonialism research, mm. representations, um, and um, especially in ethnological collection is a big problem. Yeah. So I think that could be perhaps. So basically, uh, educating ourselves through the remodeling of data also. Ex yeah. Exactly, yeah. Education is also, uh, of course, one of your primary uh, target usages. So maybe you want to tell us a little bit about maybe also potential other ways, but maybe also about uh, the applications that you do uh, most, uh, uh, most prominently foresee also in educational activities. We are at the very beginning at the moment, uh, but we have two target groups in mind. The broader public, also mentioned in our statutory purpose, we want to reach in the museums with the installations, but um, we would like to go outside as well. The deep space, as mentioned before, mm. is a great venue to do so. But um, we are looking for other settings where we could use our production and show it, show it to, um, to a broader audience. The second target group um, is a different one, and we were talking about archiving. Do we do it or aren't we archiving? Um, I think the more high-resolution images we have, the more interesting it will be also for researchers. Because we work in the field of Dutch old masters, of course we are not um, intentionally, strategically archiving our collection. But um, we move in the field of this Dutch old masters, we pick topics, we pick artists, and in the distant future I think we will have a kind of archive and we would like to make it accessible to researchers, to students um, and um, art historians especially. So these are the two main groups we have in mind for our art education program. Mm -hmm. Well, researchers, I would imagine, Katharina, are also kind of your logical first target audience, but there is, of course, many other potential uses for the kind of resource that you're creating. Yes, uh, researchers, firstly, <laughs> and of different um, research fields. Yeah? Mm. So not only uh, um, literature, also culture stud cultural studies, or edition philology, or um, even history, like, did the notebooks contain a lot of information about uh, um, history? Yes. <laughs> and they also are interesting for um, art um, science because they contain uh, drawings, a lot of drawings, wonderful drawings. <laughs> and yes, uh, we want to um, attract also um, students, but pupils also schools yeah mm -hmm. so we we um, designed a, um, a program for schools uh, um, which we want to um, um, realize in, in the next um, um, in, the, in, the, in the further project really yes <laughs> do tell oh <laughs> <laughs> sorry that is it. <laughs> okay you. okay yeah oh that's uh, <laughs> so you you challenge me. <laughs> you challenge my English. <laughs> so. But so you're planning to, to yeah. continue also, especially in the mediation direction, and also to really actively yes. include the part to work with uh, students. And, and to, to, to um, uh, ask what uh, notebooks are, for what you use notebooks, how, uh, what kind of materials there are, what, what, um, what like, uh, how artists or uh, writers work with those uh, notebooks and we want to um, offer students a kind of um, um, working spaces where they can uh, try to um, 
uh, tech, textiles, and, and, mm. and, uh, yeah, and so on, yeah. <laughs> well, that is fantastic. Then yeah. also contributing a lot to digital literacy of um, young adults, which is a topic that we are not discussing here, but we should be discussing more broadly. <laughs> Thank you very much to all the four panelists. Um, my timer says two minutes, but I know that I get two more minutes. So I would like to offer the audience, if you like, to ask us a question. Well, not me. Anybody else on this panel? Do we have any questions that we would like to pose? I will bring you a mic. Hello, um, does it work? Yeah. Uh, I would like to know a bit more about what kind of protocol um, V2 and Neural are using to kind of make the two sides work together. And um, also, I would like to know, I mean, what would the difference be between that protocol? I know you probably know more about this than uh, Alessandro, I don't know, because you're the person behind it. And uh, I mean, there is also the, the European portal that brings that it's kind of a um, polycentric um, resource, which I find it a bit of a mess anyway. <laughs> the particular, uh, the particular one. But um, anyway, what kind of protocol is it? Uh, are you using? We are passing the mic within the auditorium, Walter, if you, <laughs> if you agree. If I may, Alessandro, um, because we use the bottom-up approach instead of first designing a protocol space and pre-selecting the existing patterns uh, available from the academic space, we uh, took the classifications and nomenclature from the V2 website because that had a mature uh, metadata model based on the contents of different kinds of published uh, elements. So we have the events the site contain, we have the works, the people, the organizations, etc., which then contain names, dates, and other metadata. We then complemented that with the sets from the neural works. Uh, for instance, the archive contains all the publishing data from ISBN numbers, which then also correspond in the publications we have from V2. And from there up, we built up this organically growing uh, metadata model because we decided not to prescribe a certain set of properties that each element in the set should have, but we decided to see what data is actually available and then complement it that way. So that way we have an interchangeable format that can either be uh, extended if more data is available per item in the set, or scale back if there is less. This has led to some challenges in the search when you want to use and peruse the metadata. So we have uh, limited features there now in the current prototype, but we're looking to extend those by saying, hey, if there's a null value, sorry if this is, is very nerdy. Um, <laughs> we still, uh, we know when to omit or actually add it depending on what kind of uh, search properties were uh, given. Does, does that at least answer your question? Because I don't have a straight answer saying yes, it's, it's this protocol. We have a REST API that in the end offers different meta properties depending on what is available in either archive. I think this is a fantastic conversation for the break. <laughs> Thank you. And I invite the two of you to continue discussing. I would like to very warmly thank the audience for the discussion. Thank, first and foremost, my panelists for joining me on the stage. Please give them a warm hand. And of course, everybody for joining us here. And I'm seven seconds over, so this is it. Thank you very much. <laughs>